Hello and welcome to Pop Culture Time Capsule. I'm Anthony Danu in the I love studio Smash Mouth. with uh, Jameson Rabbit and Jeff Robbins. Oh, we're talking about 1997. The, Here we are. We got this is a, this is a fun year, right? I'm ex- I'm very excited about this. One. I was alive for this year, so I like that. I was yes. There you go. Uh, this is the one where uh, test, test, Jack test. painted Rose like one of his French girls. Uh, G.I. Jane inspired the most popular haircut at Lilith Fair. Uh, whoever they are killed Kenny. Uh, Spreewell choked, Tyson nibbled, and Mother Teresa finally burned in hell. Since My when, list is done. When does, when does, since when does he do an intro like that? I don't know. Can you, get, can you turn me up a little bit? Again? We know what happens when I turn you up, Jeff. Yeah. You just gave all our lists away. Yeah, that was it. Well, you guys have a good night, and uh, stay tuned to 103.5 The Sun, <laughs> WLSB LP, Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. What are we doing now? Who do we, who's, who's starting tonight's list? I can start some things off here. What's Sorry. the year? We're doing 1997. Jeff, do you want to tell us tell our uh, wonderful audience about how our show works? Well, the three of us uh, compile lists in secret. We go to a, We go to hermetically sealed rooms. And uh, we compile a list of 10 things that we think are important in a particular year of pop culture, which the year has been determined the week before. And then we get together here Sunday night at, our, at this radio station, and we reveal our lists. I like this radio station. And in 1997, I turned um, 26. Mm-hmm. Jameson? 20 years old. Had a fake ID and we were having good times. 1997, Ooh, very nice. Uh, I turned nine years old at the beginning of 1997. This was a big year, the first year I lived in a house, and I'm pretty sure, based on uh, some of the research doing for this year, this is the first year that I had cable. All right. So, so good I year. was able to uh, the the TV on my list takes a big, big uh, upgrade compared to years before this. All right. Well, why don't you get us started then, sir? Okay. Hey, big right. talker. Yeah. <laughs> this one's not necessarily cable related, but uh, I'm going with Will Smith's big year to start off my list for 1997. Will Smith, of course, had, uh, in 1996, he had Independence Day. It was the last time that uh, Fresh Prince would be on the air, but 1970 comes, uh, 1997 he comes back strong, Men in Black on 4th of July weekend. As well as Big Willie Style came out came out in November of 1997, sold like 10 million copies in the United States uh, since its release. One of the biggest albums of the year. Uh, the song, the movie, Will Smith in 1997 also won a Video Music Award in 1997 for the the Men in Black video for best song from a movie. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm going with Big Willie Style 1997, Will Smith's big year. He had a couple of those, right, Jeff? Are you happy with that uh, camera shot? It looks great. Does it look great? Am Does I it catch it? me eating my red vines? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. They're better than Twizzlers, you know. <laughs> this is non-profit, non-commercial radio. Right. Red vines. Delicious. All right. Is it my turn? Yeah, why not? Uh, I have a lot of movies on my list. I'll give you, uh, at least for me, probably not, uh, compa- it'll be a normal list for Mr. Rabbit, but for me, I have a lot of films, and I doubled up, or tripled up, or quadrupled up. Oh, great. A lot, a lot the, of... The dump areas in this. Okay. Oh. But this, uh, my, my number 10 is a movie that I like so much that I'm giving it a spot all its own. It's probably my favorite movie of the 1990s, and it is Paul Thomas Anderson's Boogie Nights, which I just find to be an incredible uh, piece of uh, filmmaking. It's... Uh, the best of Altman, the best of Scorsese, uh, big sprawling character, you know, sprawling scenes, sprawling, you know, just a huge cast, interwoven storylines, uh, and uh, much like uh, Scorsese, it makes you feel uh, empathetic towards gangsters. Uh, Mr. Anderson makes you feel empathetic towards porn stars. Uh, the scene where Don Cheadle is uh, refused a loan to open up his uh, stereo, his hi-fi, his hi-fi he business. High <laughs> the scene where Julianne Moore is denied custody of her uh, child because of her uh, career, uh, and, it, and it's got a great performance by Burt Reynolds. It's I mean, got, the comeback of Burt Reynolds. It was the comeback, and then it ended. I right. mean, I don't think he did anything but worthwhile I mean, he was after. Nominated it. for this, he was Oscar nominated for this movie. He won the Golden Globe yeah. and Oscar nominated. Yes. After being 
kind of a laughing stock for a decade. After previously. Cop and a Half. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I love Cop and a Half. Let me tell you what a great movie I thought that was when I was Yeah, he tried to do for um, Reynolds what uh, Tarantino did for Travolta. Right. Yeah. And Travolta kind of took it and ran with it a little bit, and Reynolds just kind of... His staying power wasn't there. Well, my my memory, if my memory serves me correctly, Burt Reynolds said he hated the movie yes. and was kind of embarrassed to be associated with it. And uh, Also, some of the best music cues uh, in this film. I mean, there's, uh, I just remember, Spill the Wine, uh, the music cue for that, uh, Brand New Key, and then the great part at the end of the film when things aren't going so well for Dirk Diggler and uh, his buddy John C. Riley, and they're in some kind of weird coke deal with Alfred Molina and uh, Thomas Jane, and we hear a little uh, Jesse's Girl and Sister mm -hmm. Christian. It's just very good music cues, and um, just a big fan of this film, and that's my number 10, Boogie Nights. And it's a real introduction to Philip Seymour Hoffman. Yeah, who, him, I, I didn't know, even mention he was, him. He was Barn Burner and Twister and various things, but then I didn't suddenly, mention William H. Macy. I didn't, yeah. Men, yeah, I didn't even mention Mark Wahlberg's name. There's right. just, it's a great cast, yeah. Great movie. Um, my number 10 is a sports event that happened in 1997 uh, a, in a rematch from uh, a heavyweight boxing fight from the year before Evander Holyfield and Mike Tyson met again June 28th of 1997 in a fight that was titled The Sound of the Fury and quickly became known as The Bite Fight. Uh, Holyfield had won the first fight uh, and then this fight they rematched and Holyfield just dominated and frustrated Mike Tyson. In the third round, Tyson bit Holyfield's, the, the top of Holyfield's ear clean off, um, spit out the chunk. Uh, somehow, somehow Judge Mills Lane, the referee of this fight, allowed the fight to resume, which blows my mind to this day. Uh, and it really then, helped his career. And then Tyson bit the left ear off, or not off, but uh, bit into the left ear. Uh, and the fight still continued on after the second bite until the end of the round when finally Holyfield's corner said, what are you doing? Look <laughs> at my man's ears. <laughs> um, so Judge Mills Lane disqualified Tyson, disqualified Tyson. He charged Holyfield's corner, tried starting a melee in the ring. Uh, it was a whole bunch of insanity. Um, and there was speculation about, you know. Can you bring the music bed down a little bit? Thank you. There was a uh, speculation that, that Tyson did it to avoid being knocked out. He knew that he was going to get knocked out, so he desperation disqualification rather than going out on his back. Um, he said that it was accidental and that it was, uh, you know, a, the first time it was a punch that knocked the top of Holyfield's ear off. Uh, later, he claimed it was retaliation for headbutts that Holyfield was landing, but uh, all in all, it was uh, the beginning of the end for Mike Tyson's career. Uh, he soon kind of became the, the joke that... Was, this was after uh, he was on Barbara Walters with Robin Quivers and yeah. was oh, yeah, basically yeah. He's saying... He's long been since divorced with Robin. Right. Yeah. Robin yeah. Givens? Robin Givens. Did I say Robin Quivers? Did. I'm sorry. <laughs> <Robin> <laughs> <Givens>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. he and Robin Givens, uh, I think she divorced him before he went to prison. But that was a creepy uh, appearance. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this, was, uh, this was unfortunately, this was when we f realized that Mike Tyson didn't have it anymore in the ring. Holyfield dominated in both fights, and it was the end. So there you go, the bite fight, my number 10. Uh, for my number 9, that is, I'm, I'm including the Mike Tyson biting Evander Holyfield. I have uh, weird sports stuff. In 1997, the Packers won the Super Bowl. How awesome was that? You also had the Bulls and Marlins. Uh, Mike Tyson bites Evander Holyfield. Why is yeah. that weird that the Packers won the Super Bowl? Uh, I'm just announcing who the champions were. It's more of a, just a note because uh, they're the best team of all time. Uh, you also had Sp uh, Latrell Sprewell, Milwaukee's own, choking his coach, PJ Carlissimo. Uh, PJ has a horrible voice. I don't know if that was yeah. the case before the Sprewell <laughs> choking, but doesn't, isn't he awful to listen to? He yeah, is he's just unlistenable. It's, it's really hard. He's on radio. Oh, man. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's like listen to Jeff Robbins. Awful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you also had the Sounds marvelous like... Marv Albert, uh, stuff going on with biting <laughs> the back. Yeah. Speaking of biting, and it counts. <laughs> Uh, the WNBA also began in 1997. Uh, there's another thing I want to talk about, the Montreal Screwjob, but I think I'm going to hold it off for maybe 1998. I'll, I'll work my way in it that way. But uh, Okay. Crazy stuff. Is that referring to the Expos? Yeah. It's a sexual It's a sexual, yeah. sexual in nature. The old Montreal Screwjob. The old job. Montreal Screwjob. I remember my well, now first I'm Montreal intrigued. Screwjob. We'll talk so about it later. Yeah, it's an off-air kind of thing. I really shouldn't have included it. Is this it like a rusty all. trombone yeah. or a <laughs> Cleveland steamer? <laughs> Good God. Yep. It's a frothy walrus. Don't Google that. 
Uh, so there you go from a number nine. Uh, choking on my soda. Thank you. <laughs> weird Red Vines. Stuff. Yes, weird so sports what that, stuff. So weird sports stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. Who'd the Marlins beat that year? They beat the Cleveland uh, Indians. It was the Cleveland Indians because they uh, two of the guys from the Chief team. Chief Wahoo? Was it, was it Jose mm-hmm. Mesa, who, who actually is no more Wahoo after no. 71 years of Wahoo? But uh, the, some of the Indians still have beef with each other about – one of them wrote a book about how they knew that this pitcher gave it up on purpose to the Marlins or all this. There's a, there's a really good backstory between the Marlins Indians World Series. All right. And then the, far, the Marlins fire sale, of course, afterwards. Yeah. You know, you're not recording this. Oh, yeah, you are. What's that over there? Oh, that's something else. Good job, Anthony. We're doing it. We've got it figured out. Jeff, Jameson have- had a thing where he didn't get something yeah, recorded. <laughs> um, I wasn't here. I left. We on what about number ten? Number nine. Number nine. <laughs> yeah, give a, what's your number ten, Jeff? What do you got? My number ten, uh, December thirteenth, nineteen ninety seven. I got to talk about SNL and every one of these. You guys sure. know that, so yes. let's just get it out of let's the way. Let's get your number nine out. And let's do it. December thirteenth, nineteen ninety seven, was an episode of Saturday Night Live hosted by Helen Hunt, featuring the musical group Hanson, mm-hmm. who uh, sang Mbop, mm-hmm. and also Merry Christmas, Baby, and it was the last. That's on my list. It was the last appearance of Norm MacDonald as Weekend Update anchor because he was fired from his position as Weekend Weekend Update anchor, ostensibly for telling too many OJ jokes. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah, you don't believe that? No, I do. You do believe that? No. <sighs> Jameson's there's so many layers to Mr. Rabbit. Why like would that onion. be the reason to fire him? Well, if you go back and watch the show, why not too many Frank Stallone jokes? Why not too many David Hasselhoff jokes? Exactly. Germans love David Hasselhoff. Germans love David Hasselhoff. Um, basically, I think that was the, uh, I don't know who put that rumor out there, if that was McD- if that was Norm, if that was Lauren Michaels, if it was something uh, constructed to make it seem edgy. Yeah. Ooh, he was being edgy. Basically, I think if you go back and watch uh, the shows, the the segment was just not registering with the audience. It was being met with a lot of stone cold Weekend silence. Update Weekend about. update, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was pretty rare for um, this to happen mid-season. Norma, uh, Lauren Michaels, n- when he did SNL the first time around, never fired anybody. And then when the 85-86 season was such a disaster, he basically had to fire the whole cast. And then he kind of got good at firing people. And he fired Adam Sandler and Chris Farley and other people. And here he fired uh, Norm MacDonald uh, midway through the season. Now, Norm MacDonald would continue to appear in sketches uh, for the rest of the season, but he was unhappy, and he you know, he actually left before the season was over. So that is my number nine, the uh, dumping, the controversial dumping of Norm MacDonald from Saturday Night Live's Weekend Update. And he was never heard from again. I don't think he's still alive. <laughs> Check out Netflix. He's got a show. Um, okay, so my number nine is uh, movie-related. It is uh, a movie that came out in 1997 that just happened to be the biggest movie in the world. It is Titanic, James Cameron's what? film. Hey, yeah. y- you ever seen this one, James? Never seen it, actually. I've never <laughs> watched it. Uh, but it was nominated for 14 Oscars, won 11 Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Director, first film ever to cross the $1 billion mark. In fact, crossed the $2 billion mark along the way. Um, has since been surpassed by James Cameron's Avatar as the uh, most profitable film of all time. He's doing okay for himself. More James Cameron? Yep. Um, huge, Sky just a, a huge technical achievement. King of the world. Do. He was the king of the world. Um, it's funny how this movie became a thing, though. James Cameron was obsessed with shipwrecks. He funded a dive to check out and film the Titanic wreckage mm-hmm. and filmed all that and then came up and said, okay, now we got to write a screenplay based off the footage that I have. And wrote the screenplay for the movie and then made this huge technical achievement in the use of CGI, the use of actual, you know, in-tank water recording, uh, just all kinds of stuff. Pretty wild stuff. I've never myself seen the entire movie. I've seen pieces of it. Why have you not seen it? So when this movie came out... Uh, you were overseas? It was, no, I was still here. I was just, I was dating my wife at the time. Somehow I managed to go through dating her and never seeing it. But uh, I rebelled against it, partially because of this song. Mm-hmm. When my wife and I got married in 19... 19- One best song at the Oscars. Yeah. In 1998, when we got married, I had an edict in my contract with our DJ that said if they play this song, I, I will not give them a check. They will not get paid for, for our wedding re- re- uh, reception. Did they play it? No. No, oh, good for them. I said, I don't care if my grandma comes up and requests a song. If you play the song, the check ain't getting cashed. 
It's, I hate this song because it was literally everywhere at all times, nonstop. Do you hate Celine Dion as well, or just this song? I'm ambivalent. She's Canadian. What's she gonna do? She's French Canadian. That she is. Ooh, that's double. That's double bad. <laughs> Yikes. No. Um, that's no, a I Montreal just, screw job. I right saw there. this yeah. movie. Uh, I saw this movie New Year's Eve, '97. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That was how I spent my New yeah. Year's Eve. One of these days, I'm sorry. I'll, one of these days, I'll watch it. But I know how it ends. It's not a terrible movie. Yeah. It doesn't deserve all the accolades, all the awards, all the money. Yeah, the greatest what's, movie of all time. What's the best James Cameron film? Uh, Anthony Doom. Uh, I would go with Terminator Two. Jameson. I yeah, do like I Avatar would, though, but I would lean that way, or perhaps Alien Two. Mm. Aliens. No, no love for the Abyss. I, I like the Abyss too. I like the Abyss. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. I remember. I was in, like I said, third or fourth grade when this came out, and girls in my class or that I knew were going to see this movie mm -hmm. some sometimes upwards of five, close to ten my sister, times. My sister told me today she saw this movie seven times in the theater. Oh, my God. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I mean, I know it's it's a very long movie, so maybe you can miss a bunch or <laughs> I don't know, but mm -hmm. it was just weird to me that this is the movie that people kept going back to see like throughout my life, the one that no people were like, you. I have to see this again. Nope. Oh. Jeff's getting into it. All right. Let's get out of this thing. My, my ears are bleeding. Well, okay, all right. <laughs> Goodbye, Celine. Mm -hmm. uh, and hello to Behind the Music for number eight. I'm going with the debut of Behind the Music on HB. I'm sorry, H H1. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of my favorite shows. This is great to get an in-depth one-hour view of some of your favorite bands. Sometimes you would watch something about a band that you had no idea you liked the rise and fall that's of right a great band. that is how it all that's how it goes every time is anyone like did anyone and sometimes the resurrection yes yeah, sometimes that's right uh but this was I, I really loved this show this was huge for me as a kid yeah. i got into so many bands because of their stories and uh we talked about jesse's girl and rick rick springfield is probably one of the people that i watched on uh behind the music but Sublime, no doubt. Dr. Dre had great episodes. Megadeth was a great episode. I wanted to ask you guys what were some of your favorite episodes and oh, or Motley Crue. Motley Crue is a great Crue is one. Motley Crue the best yeah. one in my opinion. That's that's a good one. Oh, we have the DVD of that episode. Really? <laughs> yeah. Holy they cow. made it into a. They made it as a DVD, and my wife bought it because we just loved it so much. That's awesome. Yeah, Jeff, yeah, yeah. Jeff Robbins, what about you? How about Berlin? I'm holding off. Oh. Okay. All right. Jeff's okay. All right. Well, uh, that's that's my number eight behind the music on VH1. A show I absolutely love. Yeah, I like it. Hey. Hi. Is it my turn? Nope. No. We're going to sit in just, stone uh, silence. Yeah. My number eight is another movie-related uh, entry on my list of 1997 pop culture time capsule uh, things. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I adore you. <laughs> it is, it, this is um, I abhor you. This is movies based on books and books that would become movies. Ah, interesting. Uh, so this uh, year, 1997, saw these four films come out, all of which I enjoyed, uh, that were all based on the something in the printed word uh, that uh, was previously written. Odd Couple. You had Wag the Dog, a uh, Barry Levinson film uh, starring Dustin Hoffman and Robert De Niro, which was a fine uh, political farce. Mm -hmm. You had your Donnie Brasco, mm -hmm. Al Pacino, Johnny Depp, a fine film. I forgot what that was uh, based on. Contact, Jodie Foster, uh, based on a Carl Sagan book. Right. And Private Parts, uh, Howard Stern's a biopic uh, based on his uh, autobiography, if you want to call it that. Uh, all fine films in their own right. All films I enjoyed heavily. Uh, and uh, th the other half of this entry on my list, I'm going to give it to uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, which was published in 1997 and, of course, would go on to be a successful series of books and a successful series of films. So that is my number eight, mm -hmm. movies based on books and a book that would become a film. I like it. Reading. It's fundamental. Uh, reading is tough. It is. It is tough. Um, my number eight this week uh, has to do no, no with comment. No commentary on that entry. No, because M you, Mr. Movie Guy. Yeah, they're, they're, they're movies. Okay, they're good movies. Is this where I'm supposed to play Jewel? <laughs> no. Um, my number eight uh, for '97 is notable deaths. We had five notable deaths as I wrote them here. Everyone else didn't matter. Uh, the first one was uh, we lost Princess Di in a car crash. Uh, we also lost. Mother Teresa, not in a car crash. Um, Biggie Smalls, the notorious B.I.G., was shot down 
Uh, Jimmy Stewart was not shot down. He just died of natural causes. The and race car guy? <laughs> Jimmy Stewart. Oh. <laughs> what are you talking about the That's, race car? I want to see Jimmy Stewart in a race car in 1997. What's that guy's name? Tony Stewart? Wow. Is it Tony Stewart? <laughs> He's a race car guy. Yeah. No, Jimmy Stewart, the actor. And then uh, last but not least, we lost the great Chris Farley in 1997. And I remember... Uh, two of these specifically. I remember Princess Di. I remember finding out about her death um, on VH1. Or no, MTV No, News. Jackie Stewart. Jackie. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I remember coming home from a Dick Brewer Trickle. game and uh, what, turning on MTV and finding out Princess Di had died. Serena Alchul broke the news to me on VH1 News. Or it's MTV News. I don't know. And then uh, Chris Farley. I remember somebody coming over to our house and telling us Chris Farley died. And I about slapped him in the face. I said, don't you lie like that. And... Uh, if you watch Chris Farley, he also had uh, the amazing movie Beverly Hills Ninja that came out that year. If you watch that, you, you can you can if you see Farley on his advertising junket for that movie, it shouldn't be a surprise that he is that the Will Sasso scene died. He was in a rough spot for that entire time he was out touring around with with Beverly Hills Ninja. You could tell he was. More coked than usual and more out of control than he'd ever been. More bloated than ever. He was not looking healthy. Uh, and it was just sad that we lost him. But uh, there's the five notable deaths of 97 for me. Uh, well, easy transition here. I also, <laughs> for my number seven, I have the deaths of 1997. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, of course, Chris Farley. You guys Victoria's compared BIG. lists. We, I, we did not. Uh, he showed me his. I wouldn't show him mine. Yeah, uh, <laughs> always goes that way. Uh, Princess Diana. Of course, Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, am I right? No, I'm just <laughs> am <kidding>. I right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you did have Jimmy Stewart, John Denver, Allen Ginsberg, uh, Gianni Versace, uh -huh. also Anton Sander Levey. I was going to work this into a different one involving Marilyn Manson, but he is the author of the Satanic Bible, which mm -hmm. maybe isn't what you think it is, but he was also kind of a, a spiritual advisor to Marilyn Manson and wrote uh, a, a lot of good books that maybe people would be surprised about the content when you hear satanic. But uh, Anton Sander LeVay also died in 1997. But uh, who is that? Go. He is. <laughs> he was involved in the circus, I think, many years ago. But then uh, wrote the Satanic Bible. Race he was a satanic priest. He was like the the high priest of the Satanic Church. A race car driver. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. That's so classic. Jeff, who did you have that died in 1997? We'll get to that later. Oh, very good. Ooh. All right. Well, reveal your number seven to us then. Very good. Uh, my number seven on my list is uh, another movie-related one. I like this. I like your list a lot. <laughs> And it is the start of comedy franchises. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to talk about two films in particular, one of which I'm a bigger fan of than the other one, but one which made a lot more money than the other one. The one that made a lot of money was Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me, mm -hmm. which came out in 1997, directed by Jay Roach, starring uh, everyone's um, favorite overrated SNL cast member, Mike Myers. He never got old, too. Austin, Austin Powers, Powers, Powers Oh, doing Austin Powers impression? It never gets old. Yeah, baby! <laughs> okay, I was wrong. Let's go shag, baby! <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> I was I was working on that all weekend. Good. Elizabeth Berkeley was in that movie. Or Elizabeth Hurley. Or Elizabeth oh, Hurley. <laughs> I was Hurley. it would have been better if it was Elizabeth Berkeley. <laughs> I disagree. Jesse Spano for <laughs> with a British accent? No, thank you. Vern Vern Troyer was in it. Mm-hmm. No, uh, he was not. Robert Wagner. Vern Troyer was in the second one. No, Vern Troyer was in the first one. Mini me? Oh yeah, yeah. Wasn't Sorry, it? I'm thinking of Fat Bastard. My bad. Mini me. My bad. Being... All right. Uh, so there's that, which I saw, and um, to be honest, I wasn't a huge fan of the film. I think there was a, uh, I think there was a scene in Austin Powers where um, somebody's crapping, and may, there's a Tom lot of Tom Arnold's in there with him. Tom Arnold. Is that, is that yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that was the. Who does number two work for? <laughs> <laughs> Careful, buddy! You're gonna blow an O-ring. <laughs> I think that was my favorite. Uh, <laughs> that was the best scene. That was my favorite part of the film. Of I don't. I, I never saw a two or three. Is there really? a three was unwatchable? Two is good. Three is awful. Is there that, a four? No, no. no. I wish no. there would have. Three ruined the possibility. Gold, it's just horrible. Old Member is a horrible movie. What, what makes four three so bad? 
it's just the characters are terrible. And then the three, they start jamming cameos in. Like, look, we got yeah. Tom Cruise. Look, we got all these people yeah. in this. Well, that's what SNL does. They and just jam like, cameos in. It was trying to be almost Get Shorty meets Austin Powers, yeah. and then like a weird. Yeah, the cameos was too much. It, it just it wasn't Gold a member good movie. himself was just grotesque. Gold member is not a good character. Yeah. What was the second one called? Uh, the Spy Who Shagged Me. No, that's the first one. Second no, one. And the first one's International oh, Man Oh, International Mystery. Man of Mystery is the first yeah. one. Oh, yeah. So my, the Spy my Who mistake. Shagged Me is number two. There you go. Which my I, mistake. I, I think number two is very funny. Number one is the best, though. But I love when he's in the... He's leaving the casino, and he just goes, Hey, that's there you are. And he goes, Hey, do I know you? He said, No, that's where you are. You're there. I thought that was so funny as a kid. So then my uh, the other one <laughs> on this... Not so good here, though. No, it's all right. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just moving on. Uh, also, 97, uh, a film I much... Uh, prefer mm -hmm. is a film called Waiting for Guffman, mm -hmm. which is the first in the uh, series of Christopher Guest, Eugene Levy uh, collaborations, uh, mostly improvised, all featuring similar casts. Uh, this one was about a uh, small town putting on a little show. Christopher Guest plays Corky St. Clair, uh, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, Fred Willard, uh, maybe I'm bleeding some of the movies together, Parker but uh, Parker Posey, Jennifer um, Coolidge. Thank you, Coolidge. A lot of Ed Begley Jr., a lot of Fred Jane Willard, Lynch. Michael McKean, Jane Lynch. Uh, but but yeah, waiting for uh, so it was waiting for Guffman, Best in Show, Mighty Wind for your consideration. And I think uh, Guest and Levy had a falling out after that, so probably won't see any more of those films. But it all started in 1997 with Waiting for Guffman. It's a great one. That's a it's such a funny movie. It's either that or Best in Show that are my favorite. And and Mighty the... Wind is not bad either, but Mighty Wind isn't as funny, I no. don't think. I think the characters are very uh, I think endearing. really well written. Yeah. And the music is tremendous. The music's very good. Yeah. It's a toss-up for me between Guffman and Best in Show. It kind of depends on my mood. Both yeah. of them, though, if you get the DVDs, both of them have like an hour of deleted scenes well, sure, that are it's... equally as funny as the movie. And the same thing is true with Spinal Tap. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of great deleted scenes from Spinal Tap that are just as good as anything in the movie. Mm, yeah. So good stuff. That's my uh that's my seven. Number seven. All right. So that means my number seven is up. And uh playing off of what my number eight was, which was the notable deaths of the year, uh my number seven is uh what did I call it? Notable births. No, no yeah. not quite. Uh music after tragedy. Uh, people, I, people I killed. And I, <laughs> and I said, kind of focusing on two of those deaths. Uh, Elton John in 1997, after the death of Princess Di, who he was very close to, uh, redid and re-released his hit Candle in the Wind with uh, lyrics changed to match Princess Di. All proceeds, the global proceeds of this went to Diana's Charities. This version of Candle in the Wind went on to become the second highest single ever recorded uh, behind uh, Bing Crosby's White Christmas. Mm. Sold 33 million copies of this single alone. Um, it won Elton I John. thought it was number two behind Steel Pulse. Oh, man, if only. Uh, won Elton John a Grammy. Um, you really and, like that one, don't you? <laughs> uh, and it was just a huge a huge thing for, for him and for Princess Di's charities, kind of her helping her lasting legacy uh, for people that maybe didn't know her as well. You know, like all of a sudden, like, well, why is, what's this song all about? Why are the lyrics changed? Uh, I don't think I've ever heard this song all the way through. Really? Because whenever I you would break down every time, whenever it would come on, I would just emphatically turn it off because I was against him rewriting the lyrics, one of his best songs. Okay. He made a lot of money for her charity. Well, that's that's good. Yeah. So did the Beanie Baby. Sold thirty three million. Um, the other uh, the other song I have uh, after a tragedy is uh, the tribute to Biggie Smalls, notorious B.I.G. Um, after he was shot down uh, while he was recording an album that said. That was uh, that was uh, dubiously titled uh, about his death. Um, his uh, all of his friends, Puff Daddy, life after death, life after death. Puff Daddy, Faith Evans, the group 112 came together uh, and recorded a song called "I'll Be Missing You" um, that uh, borrowed heavily from Sting's uh, Sting song. Uh, every breath you take. Doesn't Sting actually sing on this one? Well, he did eventually, but they did it without his permission. So Sting owns 100% of the royalties to this song. Oh, nice. Because they didn't bother to uh, get his permission. So eventually at the Grammys, he came out and sang on it. It's uh, kind of a make peace gesture. But uh, they did not ask to sample <laughs> every breath you take. The video mu MTV Music Video Awards yeah. as well. That okay, year. yep. Um, or if, oh, yeah. And this song really launched Puff Daddy. It made Puff Daddy something instead of just the background guy for Notorious B.I.G. This came out on his album, No Way Out, um, which then was 
this song was uh, number one in the charts for 11 consecutive weeks. Puff Daddy had a massive album because of this. Uh, this was also a Grammy winner, both the album, Puff Daddy's album for yeah. Best Rap Album, and this song for Best Rap Performance. Yep. Uh, both won Grammys, and it suddenly it launched, gave us P. Diddy, or whatever you want to call him today. But uh, both of these songs were huge, huge successes uh, of seven based on tragedies of that year. My number seven. Very good. Good stuff. Good stuff. Jamison Rabbit bringing his A game tonight. Bringing the heat, boys. 97. Finally That's figured right. it out. I <laughs> finally figured it out. <laughs> how, are my, uh, how are my Red Sox doing? I thought your Red Vines aren't doing so well. I know that. Killing those. You're a Red Sox fan tonight? No. Suddenly we're the Red Sox guy, yeah? Just want to know how they're doing. Okay, I'll tell you in a minute. How okay. am I, how my Chiefs doing? <laughs> <laughs> Five and oh. <laughs> All right, what do we listen to? What's this? Uh, this is a South Park theme song for my number six. I've got the cartoon debuts of 1997. Uh, you don't just have South Park, which is certainly the biggest one. You also have Recess, Pepper Ann, two of my absolute favorites. Uh, we we saw Eric Idle last Saturday. He was a recurring character as Galileo on, on Recess, a couple episodes there, just to bring you guys into it. But uh, also Daria, Johnny Bravo. Angry Beavers debuted. South Park's got to be the biggest one. I was watching back some of the 1997 original episodes uh, with Cartman Gets an Anal Probe and the Halloween episode. and Scu- you guys, I'm going home. Exactly. Uh, Scuzzlebutt, Cartman's mom's a you-know-what. Uh, mm-hmm. a, a multi-episode spanning story arc. But I, South Park really took over. This is, I would oh, yeah. say, of all of the adult cartoon comedies, South Park was the one that I identified with the most because I was in fourth or fifth grade when I started watching. And then, uh, but I, I would take this one over The Simpsons, over Family Guy. I think they've also they've they're still going at it. They're still releasing mm-hmm. South Park episodes. They just had a, a new season, which I, was maybe their twenty first, just uh, a sure. month or two ago. That adds up. Yeah. Out on Blu-ray. There you go. So, uh, but I I really do. I know they're much different now with what they can do with uh, with computers and everything. But some of the first. Like cardboard cutout South Park episodes, seasons from 1997 were some of the best in mm-hmm. my opinion. I went back and watched some of those this week. It was uh, it was a blast. Nice. So for my number six, I've got South Park and the cartoons of 1997. All right, Mr. Robbins, you big Angry Beavers guy, Jeff. Okay, my number six. He's not even <laughs> talking to you anymore. <laughs> It's Montreal screw jobs and angry beavers. <laughs> yeah, can we? Is this? I don't think. Yeah, this is uh, not fit for prime time. It was a Nickelodeon show. Um, well, you know they always, you know Disney, the animators always snuck in like sex in the boobs, clouds, you know, yeah, during yeah, an, an, animation. Yeah, silly. You don't mention the word boobs enough on this show. We don't. Um, my number six on my list is uh, iconic sitcom episodes of 1997. Bear with me here, please, won't you? Uh, In 1997, we were introduced to uh, a couple major things on Seinfeld. We were introduced to the yada yada that happened in 97. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Get that out. Wow. We were also introduced to Festivus in 1997. Festivus is not over until you (laughs) pin me to the ground. It's time for the airing of the grievances. (laughs) Um, yes, we all gather on the pole. And, yes. Yeah. Um, also, in 1997, um, this is not, uh, maybe I should say memorable, not iconic. Let's go with memorable. I'm going to change that. Change that in your book. Yep, in the notes. Uh, Rose, we find out the last season of Roseanne was all a crazy dream yeah. and that they didn't win the lottery and that uh, Dan hadn't had an affair. He had died of a heart attack and it was a sad thing. Sad, sad, sad. But. The most memorable sitcom from 1997, and it maybe it seems tame now, but at the time was a big deal. Ellen DeGeneres on her show comes out as a lesbian character. That was a big deal in 97. Yeah, it was. People were boycotting. Yeah, people yeah. were up in arms. Yeah. How dare you? Yep. What kind of sicko are you? Cancel this program. Get it off the, yeah. What Unfortunately, I mean. Think about the children. I think the show only lasted one season after because yeah. it, it sort of. It sort of uh, caved built, in under the weight that? of that of that monument yeah. that monumental. Uh, and she thing. was never heard from again either. 
I think she's dead. <laughs> her and Norm her right and next Norm. to each other. <laughs> Oh, man. So that's my number six uh, memorable sitcoms of '97 sitcom episodes: The Idea Out of the Festivus, Roseanne, and most notably the Puppy episode. It's called the Puppy episode because they want to give away right the plot. After this episode, we are going to have our feats of strength. Just so you know, that's how we know Can't Festivus wait. has begun. Okay, for my number six, Anthony's been dancing around this all night. I don't know why because we're just going to get into it. My number six is. The, the Montreal Screwjob. Yes. So, oh, yes. Among the biggest, most impactful moments in wrestling history. Um, started a conspiracy about whether it was real or if it was worked, whether it was fake, uh, where you have your champion in Bret Hart, who is about to leave the company for the rival company and rich, big riches, but he doesn't want to lose the title in his home country. Uh, and there's a whole conspiracy about, okay, well, how are we going to get it off him? Okay, Brett, we won't take it off you tonight. And uh, in a sport where everything is predetermined, this was not. Uh, they came out, they basically stole the title off of his waist, gave it to Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, uh, furious. Um, and it's something that lingered for two decades uh, after that. Uh, what was really amazing about this and really fortuitous was the entire thing was captured on a documentary called Wrestling with Shadows. A film crew was following Brett the Hitman Hart around this time. And so they just happened to be there with cameras uh, behind the scenes for all of this. You get to see the reactions of everyone involved. It's just an amazing bit of good luck that they were there. Um, it launched uh, Shawn Michaels to mega stardom. Saw Brett the Hitman Hart leave and really never be the same after this. And more importantly, I think, launched the character of Mr. McMahon as a character where it was, instead of just Vince McMahon, the commentator, suddenly Mr. McMahon became a character that to this day is still the central part of wrestling in the WWE. Um, it's, I think it's up there with, you know, with Hogan getting the title. And I mean, there's there's a very, very small handful of moments. I think this is one of the most important ones in wrestling i think this is the most fascinating moment or story in wrestling history because it was at a pay-per-view it was one of if not the biggest star at or you know mm -hmm. at, at the time it was uh, the top champion. guy that was the champion and wrestling became real for a second you don't know what to believe and uh, the documentary you're talking about is amazing that's why i was like ah maybe i'll save it for 98 because that's mm -hmm. when the documentary came out but this is pretty crazy. They wrote something to happen. A wrestler went in thinking that the, the finish would be one way. Yep. And in the ring, the referee called for the bell before he actually tapped out. Yeah. And to me, like you said, with the, the beginning of the Vince McMahon character and uh, Bret Hart spitting yeah. in in uh, Mr. McMahon's eye, kind of got the beginning of the Attitude Era, too. One of the yep. most crazy eras of professional wrestling where Jerry Springer met professional wrestling, met Jackass, yep. met Howard Stern. And uh, I think when I'm trying to tell someone of why I like wrestling, I think one of the easiest things to try and make them understand is is uh, this and, and like the 1998 Hell in a Cell. But I think the, the Montreal Screwjob is one of the most fascinating things in all of wrestling. It's uh, the in the documentary about it, too. Wrestling with Shadows is such a good, like you said, the lucky timing of getting this. And to, the, to this day, people don't know whether or not they're not 100% sure whether right. or not it was real or who knew and who yeah. didn't. Um, some of the stories backstage from like The Undertaker and Bruce Prichard and all this stuff is still to me like it's it's one of the best things in wrestling. If you're it, it's super fascinating. You can find the documentary on YouTube for free. So yeah. if you're interested, uh, Wrestling with Shadows is out there. Oh, it's well worth the watch. Yes, and I don't think you have to be a wrestling fan to enjoy this documentary whatsoever. No. Um, when I first watched it, I I had the I was in the Bret Hart camp for a long time, mm -hmm. and more and more it just seems like he was such a jaded evil not evil but jaded selfish selfish star um to, everything to, should be revol revolve around him. yeah and i don't think that and any, he's one of my favorite wrestlers. <laughs> exactly no I, I think he's one of but the he's best wrestlers way. ever is yeah it, but it, it should revolve around me as it ages it makes actually bret hart look worse in some ways yeah. but i remember for the first few years of watching that i was like god i can't believe they did him that that way yeah. um but really one of the most fascinating things in wrestling i really think people should uh, should check this out you're big, um, big on the Montreal screw job, Jeff. Did you guys know that Jay Leno is guesting in this Tim Allen show? Did you guys, were you guys aware no, of that? No, I haven't watched a Tim Allen show in quite a while. Last Man Standing, yeah. Jay Leno's guesting. Yeah. 
There's your Montreal screw job for you, Jeff. I hope you're happy. I'm so glad we were ahead of time so we could talk about that. I thought it was uh, something to do with the Expos. When did the Expos go to Montreal? 94. 2003. Wow, that's 2008. Different uh, answers. Yeah. yeah. The I believe the Washington Nationals came in, became, or the Expos became the Nationals in 04. There you go. I think Montreal will get a team back. No. I, no, it's taxes, right, Jameson? Yeah, is that what the issue just, is? Nobody wants to play there because you got to pay an, just a crazy amount of money. So, 04 or uh, 2005 it's was the first It's not like they were putting any butts and seats Washington in that Nationals. stadium. I mean, nobody came out to see them. Ah, but it's Montreal, Canada! <laughs> Another reason. No. Just like Celine Dion. No. Romy Michelle's high school reunion. No. What about it? I thought that might be the, the hot ticket word He's, of the night. <laughs> oh, I didn't do that tonight. <laughs> what the hell? He's for a buzz was it, was it going to be Romeo and Michelle? Tell him yes so he just knows. Yeah, it was. Flubber, got you. <laughs> got, got you. you Actually, the word of the, the it was screw job. <laughs> you guys both would have won. <laughs> Nailed it. All right. Uh, okay, so that was my number six, which means the new. It's your number oh, five. Oh, that was, man, we spent a lot of time on that. Yeah. Oh. I, I can go back oh, to sleep. Gosh, yeah, I go forgot. Back to sleep. You're not needed yet. Uh, I'm going with my favorite movies of 1997. This is a this is selfish. This is very Bret Hart of me. I'm going to talk about my favorite movies from 1997. Austin Powers, covered by Jeff Robbins. I like Mike Myers more than you guys, and I don't I don't think he's spectacular, but I think Austin Powers is a hilarious movie. Fifth Element. That's a really fun mm-hmm. sci-fi action film. I rewatched Face Off this week for this show. Mm-hmm. John Woo is a crazy person. I, I there's parts in the movie where I'm like, is he trying to do like a nod towards Sam Raimi because there's a guy running with, you can see him running with, uh, you know, the, like the wire attached to him. And then in the next scene, he gets blown away and you can clearly see him like rotating backwards from the string. But it is a very fun movie. There's a lot of weird stuff with crashes and you're, there's just fireworks shooting out of things yeah. on it that should not be happening whatsoever. Uh, you also have Gross Point Blank. Mm-hmm. Uh, big on, big on that. Jeremy Piven. Dan Aykroyd. That's a fine John Cusack. John Cusack. Ten you, years, is, man. Ten driver. years. Yes. Like Go ahead. Movie. What were you going to say? Yeah, it's a good film. You like that red vine? <laughs> just found out. I, it's like NPR over here? What's going on? <laughs> just found out I can't have children. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Molly Shannon oh, boy. on a I gas tire. Oh, Mm-hmm. Yeah, Rachel Dra- right. well that too yeah uh I also love Jackie Brown it's it's I think actually one of the lesser Tarantino films but Absolutely. I think Jackie Brown is still a very good film big cast there Chris Tucker like not in the film for very long mm-hmm. but build for the movie it's uh one of those Drew Barrymore scream incidents kind mm-hmm. of uh Chasing Amy Kevin Smith as I get old as a kid I didn't quite understand it compared to the other Jay and Silent Bob or the uh, Jersey trilogy it was called but as I get older Chasing Amy has actually become a better movie to me. Uh, I watched Liar Liar last night. Very funny film. I think this is the beginning of the best era of Jim Carrey. I know we have some disagreements but the pen is blue. (laughs) I think this is maybe him at his best because there was a reason for him to be that crazy character. Are you that doing that? Kicking my own ass. I, yeah, I thought uh, rewatching Liar Liar for the first time in years, I thought it was extremely funny. But then after this, I think that he had some of his best movies with Man on the Moon, and uh, it's because he got rid of Jennifer Tilly. Yes, Jennifer Tilly. Gosh, yeah. she was great in Was it Bride of Chucky? Yeah, that's oh what she's man, good yes, wonderful stuff. So there you go. I've got my favorite movies of 1997. Is that your only movie entry on your list tonight? I think it might be. Okay. Just I look curious. through. Yes. Well, he yes. left off a lot of good films. I left okay. off a lot of good films. We'll talk about them. Don't worry. I watched uh, Full Monty this week also for the first time and L.A. Confidential. Both very good movies, but I didn't feel like I could put them on my list having okay. just seen them. But they're great. What's your next movie, movie uh, suggestion here, Jeff? What are we on? Five? Four or five, yep. Well, for my five... We're talking about something that we've already talked about, and that is uh, the premiere of Behind the Music on VH1, uh, which uh, I remember very well watching. I don't know uh, what promotional uh, voodoo got into me, but I remember watching the premiere uh, night, which was a back-to-back MC Hammer and Millie Vanilli. Both classic episodes. Classic episodes. And unfortunately, they had to to re-edit or um, redistribute the uh, Millie Vanilli one after Rob... Yeah. Killed himself. Yeah. 
But uh, just great stuff. You guys were talking earlier about some of your favorite uh, behind the musics. I uh, I like the Journey episode, mm-hmm. and uh, I like the Hall and Oates episode. Mm-hmm. Big shot. Um, yeah, of course. <laughs> I prefer generally the band ones because you know the, seeing the band splintering and well, and the dynamics. the infighting and yeah, yeah. yeah that's all as opposed cool. to one singer. Yeah, sure. it's usually a sadder story if one guy just sort of or one female yeah. or one artist just sort of falls apart. Right. I prefer the infighting. You, know, like you mentioned the Molly Crew episode. Um, but yeah, there's like 600 or some crazy oh, number. And I wish uh, these were on. And maybe they are, and I'm just ig- ignorant of it, but maybe they're on VH1 Classic or something. But I would, uh, if I found one of these flipping around the dial tonight, I would, you know, stop uh, stop and watch it. They're good stuff. You too. Yeah. yeah. You too. So that's my number five. All right. Behind the music. And behind the music became so popular that they started artists started releasing compilations on yeah. cd like the behind the music <laughs> compilation yeah. it yeah. became the band-aid of of that because then they started just coming out other other brands would come out with like basically behind the music type things and it just became whether it was behind the music or not it would be called a behind the music thing right and then yes. you know, yeah, that's a good anthony's point. got the list pulled up and i think i think they sort of stretch themselves a little thin because i'm seeing like Without el I'm saying like Elton John and Billy Joel. Yeah. Well, they haven't really fallen apart yeah, like yeah. some of the other artists. Well, still touring and making millions of yeah. dollars. Oh, right. man. Yeah. Remember was... that rough year when they had a, a bad album that came out and then they right. followed it up with a massive tour? They even did start, started doing some updates ac- actually afterwards sure. because bands, the, you know, the story had yet to be really Because it written. probably sold albums too. I mean, Oh, the Styx one is good too. Yeah. you got to love it though they if you're hate one of those Young. Yeah. Because it had to sell albums for you. For sure. Of course, one of these long dormant bands. You think there's a formula? And suddenly, to this Blondie's too, right? selling a bunch of albums because, because yeah. they're behind the music. Yeah, I mean, you're curious about them. Yeah, I'll like, check oh, them I out. I about Blondie. I'll go check them out. And then, of course, behind the music would uh, spawn, of course, one of the most famous SNL sketches of all time. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, more cowbell. More cowbell. Thank Absolutely. you. Um, my number five selection is one that Anthony talked about a few moments ago. It is the debut of the show South Park from. From creators Trey Parker and Matt Stone, a great subversive comedy about a group of four kids living in an adult world, told through this crude cutout animation style. Um, I think South Park is underrated for how smart their writing is, how great they are at satirizing mature topics in pop culture, um, taking really dense, controversial topics and really digging into them through the under the guise of oh, it's just four kids that are basically you know crude animation. What, what could we do to cause any trouble? I, I think that South Park is um, underrated in what they are capable of. I think Trey Parker and Matt Stone are really funny guys and really smart guys. And you've seen what they've done outside of that. I mean, they've done other things that have been really cool and really smart. Um, Basketball. I, I them. Or Gosmo. <laughs> oh, Gosmo. Or Gosmo. Or Gosmo. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, South Book Park. Of Mor- Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon is what I was yeah, leading to. Um, but yeah, I really, I really enjoy South Park. Um, I haven't kept up on it in it's, the last couple it's years. It's hard. It's very, you know? been a very but, hard. But uh, it's really enjoyable stuff. And when it came out in 1997, I was 20 years old. It hit me right in my wheelhouse. I was all about this, this type of humor. So, my number five. What are you looking at, Jeff? What are you looking at? I'm just looking at the board, making sure the levels are still yeah, there. Still on. You guys take. South Park, Simpsons, or Family Guy? They're kind of the big three. If you want to throw another one in there, go ahead. But what do well, you got? Well, I don't think Family Guy is even in the same ballpark. I think a lot of young people younger than me would disagree with well, you. Well, screw young people. I'm an <laughs> old guy, and I'm bitter. What are you going with? Um, I prefer South Park to The Simpsons, but yeah. it's but it's fairly close. Yeah, I agree. Hmm. I agree. And I'm on board with that. I think if I think maybe if Simpsons had stopped after season ten, it actually might be closer. Right. I think that their longevity has done them a disservice. I think they've outlived their relevancy. Who what do you, has? Simpsons. Yeah. What do you like better, Kenny Loggins or Michael McDonald? Ooh, that's a good one. Why, why are we doing that's this a good again? One. It's the Caddyshack question of the night. Mm-hmm. All right, we're in our top four. Are we? We better slow down. It's yeah. only 8.50. Oh, we got, no, That's we're doing this for, on, on purpose. I got a lot to talk about in these top four. You I said that wait. last week, and then you sort of clammed we up. We might go two more hours. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're definitely going to. Can we do more uh, Toronto taint job or whatever it was called? <laughs> Cut it. We're done. That's it. Oh oh, the that's Toronto the, that's the title job. for the episode, Toronto taint job. I can't wait. That's the t- 1997, the Toronto taint job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my word. That's great. 
Jeff, thank you so much for that. Uh, okay. For my number four, kicking things off, is uh, the alternative albums of 1997. I got five specific ones that I'm going to go for here. Uh, Foo Fighters, who I played a second ago, they had The Color and Shape. That was their second album. You had Green Day's Nimrod. Uh, Blink-182's Dude Ranch. Got to throw Radiohead's OK Computer in there. I really like the reggae version of that done by the Easy Star All-Stars. And, of course, Everclear, so much for the afterglow. The alternative albums of 1997. Uh, all of these had songs that I absolutely loved when they came out and still love to this day. And if you had asked me when I was a kid, I would, probably would have said that... Uh, Green Day would have been my favorite band at the time, and then and that song, Hitchin' a Ride, probably took out Basket Case for my favorite song as a kid. Uh, I absolutely loved that album. You also got Nice Guys Finish Last and uh, Good Riddance, which is mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the most popular song probably off of any of these albums combined. Is that the Time of Your Life song? That's Yes, it is. Thank you. Wow. Impressive. From the Seinfeld final episode? Is that right? From every final episode, I think. <laughs> yeah. Every graduation and final episode yes. from 1997 through 2003. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, so I got the alternative albums for my number four. Oh, I uh, yeah, uh, Color and Shape is a fine album. You got you got your Monkey Wrench. Is that on that album? Love Monkey Wrench. Everlong? That was right up there. Everlong's great. My, my Hero, name. is that on that? Yep, Doll. And then the deluxe version of that comes with a cover of Baker Street, which is awesome. Oh. It has guitar instead of the exceptional um, knowledge, percussion. I might have more on the Foo Fighters. That's one later. of my. That's one of my favorite albums, Color and Shape. I think Color and Shape is is their finest album. Yeah, I like it. Also, Damn It by Blink One Eighty Two. Love that song. Mm-hmm. Never heard of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so dismissive. <laughs> Love it. Uh, no, I like Foo Fighters. No, go, I, I know you do. Uh, my number four is, um, I'm calling Everything Old is New Again. Okay. So bear with me on this one, too. I found 97 to be very fruitful. Uh, in 19, 1997, you had uh, three classic rock artists who came back and uh, produced uh, some fine work, which I would rank from being uh, pretty good to on par with anything they've ever done. And I'm going to... Um, pretty good was Bridges to Babylon. That was the Rolling Stones album that came out in 97, which is maybe is best known for uh, they got sued by Katie Lang for ripping off uh, Constant Craving oh, for yeah, that's right. Has Anybody Seen My Baby? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, it's a fine album, though. Um, and then uh, Flaming Pie, Paul McCartney, probably one of his... Um, I might go out on a limb here. If you discount Wings, I know you're a big Wings guy, Jameson. Sure, yeah. Flaming Pie might be my favorite pure McCartney solo album. That's a very, very good album and a return to form for him. He the previous couple of years uh, doing uh, the Beatles anthology and I think uh, it was sort of uh, something rubbed off on him. And um, I just love the song. Calico Skies is a great song. Flaming Pie refers to uh, when John Lennon was asked back in the day where they got the name Beatles. He told some silly story about how a man came to him on a flaming pie and said, you shall be the Beatles. And so that's kind of a little homage to um, Mr. Lennon there. And then Time Out of Mind came out in 1997, uh, which uh, just really shocked the hell out of people because Bob Dylan had not really produced an album of original material in about 10 years. He had, he had released a couple album of albums of folk covers, uh, Good As I've Been to You and World Gone Wrong. Then he got together with Daniel Lanois, Lanois, Lanois. French Canadian. Am I close on that? Don't like him. And Toronto just some Saint really John. good atmospheric, creepy, depressing stuff. He recently had some health issues, and I think he was feeling his own mortality. And there's a lot of talk about death and dying and sickness on this album, and uh, just some really good, good, uh, good music on this album. Mm-hmm. And uh, really uh, was very comforting. And it kind of kickstarted a little late, another renaissance for Mr. Dylan. Um, Love and Theft would come out in modern times, and um, there you go. And then also in my Everything Old is New Again, in 1997, we had the 20th anniversary of the Star Wars films that were all released. Well, 20th anniversary of Star Wars, but all three of the original films re-released in the theaters with sparkling new effects. Oh, 
so much. Some some story edits, Ugh. some changes. Oh, let's just put let's put Jabba in this one now. And Solo I'm not shot first. Everything about those I hate. And oh, I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not such a you know Star Wars fanatic that I didn't just like seeing the films again on the mm -hmm. big screen and experiencing them again in that format. But yeah, I, I mean I would agree with you that you leave it alone. But it was fun to see him again on the big screen. Jedi is the only one that I went to that I rewatched, and it was just in the theater. Stance, but I did rewatch that. We, one. We I went, went to I went to all three of them. Yeah, we went and saw them did all. You? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, a couple of times when they came up. Because right. it is it's Star Wars on the big screen. Right. It had been a while since I seen it on the big screen, but right. there was so many. Specifically with Jedi, when they changed the song in the throne room, and suddenly there's a different song, and then at the end, instead of the Ewoks celebrating with Yub Nub, Yub Nub. And it, all of a sudden, there's this like a U2 song almost playing, and it's spanning the galaxy. That infuriates. Eventually, me. they would take out the the Darth Vader for the a real, more... the original Anakin, yeah. and putting in Hayden Christensen. Yeah. It's just a horrible maneuver. Yeah. But yeah, Star Wars on the big screen. I like it. Everything old, new again. What about when Celine Dion appeared in God. Empire Strikes Back to sing uh, a love theme? Mama. That's Celine Dion. She's no good. So that's my number four. Again. Everything old is new again. Um, my number four selection is the concert tours of 1997. Woo. There were several, but I have three in particular that I'm going to focus on. First, it is when Lilith Fair began, founded by Sarah McLaughlin, uh, solely featuring female artists. Um, the 1997 version uh, was a uh, murderer's row of female artists of the time. Sarah McLaughlin, Cheryl Crow, Jewel, Paula Cole, Suzanne Vega, Tracy Chapman. Elizabeth Berkeley, Not quite. Lisa Loeb, The Indigo Girls, Sean Colvin, Natalie Merchant, Joan Osborne, The Cardigans, Fiona Apple, and Meredith Brooks. That was your lineup, and they toured around, uh, and the Little Fair was the highest grossing uh, uh, festival of 1997. They went on for a couple more years. Uh, folded up shop, and then tried reopening again, I think, in 2001. Hmm. Sophie B. Hawkins? Sophie B. Hawkins, that's a, yeah, that's a, something. Um, I went to a Sophie Hawkins dance one time. It didn't turn out well. Um, also, 1997 uh, was uh, Michael Jackson's final tour, the His Story Tour. Um, he uh, he went out on what no nobody would think would be his final tour in 97. It turned out to be. Um, and another one that I enjoyed was uh, Rage Against the Machine and Wu-Tang Clan went out on tour together in 1997. Um, and uh, specifically, I, I included this because I, I was at this tour. Uh, Tinley Park, Illinois, August 30th was the final date for Wu-Tang on this tour. Uh, I was there, standing there at Tinley Park watching it. Um, uh, there was some, subsequently some arrests because uh, there was a huge fight with Wu-Tang after the show. And uh, they came out looking for... Uh, a couple of the Wu-Tang Clan to arrest. Um, this was a massive show, though, where Wu-Tang, at least when I saw Wu-Tang opened, Rage came on, and then they came on together, and they did some jams, and it was um, amazing stuff. Um, and just looking at it, there were a dozens of festivals, music festivals that were started in 1997 that I didn't know about, and most of them lost all their money in 1997. Uh, most of them were the first and last annual of that version, but uh, these three were big ones for me. So that was the first year I think Ozfest was actually like a traveling tour, not just like a two-day mm -hmm. thing, mm -hmm. maybe in select cities. But yeah, that was a that was a good year, and that Wu Tang Rage Against the Machine, man, it does not get much better than good that, stuff. especially with like Ghostface coming up there to while Tom Morello's playing yeah, guitar. Yeah. I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. I enjoyed it. So there What's you go. the name of the uh, Insane Clown Posse? Their fans. Juggalos. The Juggalos. Yeah. You big Fago guy? Yeah, he loves getting sprayed with Fago great soda. Fago. Mountain mist or moon mist? Moon mist. Good stuff. To this day, I walk with a limp because of uh, one of the Juggalo shows I went to. <laughs> bit him right in the leg. The Juggalettes bit him in the leg. Rabbit. Rabbit <laughs> Juggalos. <laughs> All right. What do you have at number three, Anthony? All right. For my number three, I've got David Debuts. I'm going with David Spade and Just Shoot Me, as well as David E. Kelly with Ally McBeal, The Practice. Mm -hmm. This was pretty great. He's got two shows revolving around law firms, Ally McBeal on Fox, the more comedy-driven, romantic comedy-esque, whereas The Practice kind of the more real, gritty, uh, 
I guess, law firm crime show. But there were some crossovers, which is very rare. The practice, I believe, was on ABC. Ally McBeal on Fox. And there was a, a few seasons in, I believe, they would have characters from each show uh, on the opposite networks. Uh, Ally McBeal, you had the Vonda Shepard at the bar that they went to all the time, and the Dancing Baby, which to me was kind of one of the first viral videos. I remember watching that video before it was of a dancing baby, like a computerized baby, before it was ever on Ally McBeal, and that was kind of her biological clock ticking, I guess, in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, I also was introduced to uh, Lucy Liu, Portia de Rossi, and Josh Groban via Ally McBeal. And, and Jane uh, Krakowski. There you go. Ooh, very nice. Um, on the practice, you've had uh, Dylan McDermott, D Dylan McDermott as Bobby Donnell, and uh, a lot of good characters. I, I really wa loved watching Who's both lady of on these the practice? shows. Cameron, the Manheim. Cameron Manheim. I always liked her. She what are we listening to right now? Uh, this is Criminal. <laughs> Fiona <laughs> Apple. This is Fiona Apple. This is one of the hottest videos of 1997. Why are we hearing uh, "Searching My Soul" by Vonda Shepard? We're talking about Alan McBeal. Oh my bad. Here, I've been searching I, my you know, soul tonight. I, yeah. Why don't I just get that? Going for you. There you go. Is that good? What happened to Vonda Shepard? Saw her at Summerfest. Not this year. No. <laughs> <laughs> was she, was she begging for change? The wife was a big fan of uh, the, the Allie McBeal. I'm so. guessing she was on a Lilith Fair in 1998, right? I, I We saw her in the Semisonic uh, back to back. Mm -hmm. Kind of odd. Nice. That's a great double billing. Hall of Fame double bill. <laughs> sure. You can go. You can go see both of them performing at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for change. And then afterwards, they just got together and did a whole big Montreal screw job together on, <laughs> oh, on the I stage. Oh, I would hate to see that. <laughs> oh my goodness! There you go. Lots of Davids. David E. Kelly. He knows what he's doing. Yeah, he knows how to make TV. But I'm curious. I want Were to, you? I want oh. to look up Cameron Mannheim now. I haven't thought about her in 20 years. Were you a big fan of Just Shoot Me? You kind of passed over that yeah, quickly. Yeah, that was actually the other show that I watched this week. I own the DVDs for season one and two. I find this to be I find it to be a very funny show. The other way I was thinking about doing this, if I didn't include the practice, because I do like the character Bobby Donald and Dylan McDermott, would have been TV shows where the main character is the worst character. Because Ally McBeal on Ally McBeal's cast, she's by far the worst character. And then if you look at uh, Laura San Giacomo mm -hmm. from from Just Shoot Me, I think she is also the worst character by far. What do, what do, you, DeMora, what do you mean Mia by Van worst? Horn, the least interesting character. She's the most boring and least to offer to, or even sometimes annoying in uh, in uh, Laura San Giacomo's Yeah, but that Laura instance. San Giacomo was easy on the eyes. Was she? I, you know what? I would have taken Nina Van Horn over Laura San Giacomo. She was an ants. Gotta love ants. Cameron Mannheim still acting to this day. I have... Not is there a law against that? Single thing that she's done, though. <laughs> what has she been in most recently? Most recently, uh, a TV series called Living Biblically, a movie oh. called All About Nina. Um, yeah, she's got some upcoming projects called the Ooh, the Effort List. Yeah. Risque, yeah. controversial, controversial to be sure. There you go, Cameron Manheim update, everyone. So I've got David debuts. Are I you? Like are you guys? Wasn't she in Misery? Dance? No, those catty bits. Oh, <laughs> oh my God! Monster. What that? What's that, Anthony? Did you guys like Just Shoot Me? Or am I? Am I? It's fine if I'm I alone did. on that one. But I, like I thought that me. was a very funny show. I'm a big George Siegel guy. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I like Just Shoot Me. It's fun enough. It was sort of like oh, like Brian Fraser's over. I'll watch Just Shoot Me. Okay, yeah. that works. It's fun. Mm -hmm. I found there's a lot of like really corny jokes, but. This week rewatching it, I had a lot of fun. I thought it was there was some really good good moments, and uh, David Spade to me is the best character, at least for that first couple seasons. Smarmy, smarmy, smarmy a little is the nerd. Word. Yeah. yeah, fit his fit his persona very well. Yes. Well, uh, you're listening to 103.5 FM, The Sun, WLSPLP, Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. We're in the middle of pop culture time something. What is it? Time pop, capsule. Pop culture time capsule. Talking almost, about 19. Almost got it there. Almost and Jeff it. Robbins is about to reveal his number three My choice. My number three choice is the well, you guys talked about this already a little bit. Uh, I only have one death on my list. Uh, it is the death of Madison's own Chris Farley, December 18th, 1997. And um, I don't know what else to say about this. Of course, it was n not necessarily a stunner, uh, as you alluded to, uh, his physical appearance uh on uh, not only the promotional tour of Beverly Hills Ninja and, and his appearance uh, 
when did that movie come out? The that came out before his dead, before his death. Yes. though. it was not released posthumously. No. Yes, uh, but also uh, just a couple months uh, before that, he hosted SNL, yeah. um, and uh, mm-hmm. the uh, the whole uh, running gag through that episode of SNL was. Will he be all right to perform? Will he be sober enough yeah. to perform? And and um, you had Chevy Chase on there as his, apparently his sponsor. You had um, Chris Rock, who uh, Lauren Michaels called in to host in case Chris Farley was not able to host. And um, watching that show again recently, he's not terrible in the show, but he just is incredibly fat and sweaty. Just sweaty. Just bleary eyed yes. and sweaty. Yeah, he, he he pulls off the performances okay, I think. I don't think it's a disastrous yeah. uh, show. Because uh, he's physical comedy. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, you know, comedy, they, he's falling through things great. They do a Matt Foley thing, and he rides an exercise bike yeah. through a wall for no yeah, reason. Spin class and, to take it through, yeah. Right, and uh, yeah, so there you go. But, uh, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I personally, I mean, I would probably have to get to a list of 25. 20 or 25 SNL cast members before I would put Chris Farley on my best of list. But still, um, a talent cut down too soon. Yeah, absolutely. Sadness. And the, the Madison um, connection, too, is... Yep. Yeah. So there you go. Number three, Chris Farley. Okay, so my number three. You guys have been talking about movies this whole time. The only thing I've gotten to talk about is a stupid Titanic film. So not, I Did you ever see that movie? I've some films out that I have seen and that I enjoy. And I'm kind of uh, vacillating between whether I call this memorable films or favorite films. It's kind of a little bit of, uh, because some of these are like big, impactful films that I don't like. Some of them are films that I, I think are amazing that maybe weren't hugely successful. First one is, Je- Jeff, you mentioned Boogie Nights. Yeah. Boogie Nights, tremendous movie. Still holds up strong. Thank you. Love it. Another one that is, I think, my, one of my favorite movies of this year, L.A. Confidential. Love that movie so much. Sure. Also, The Fifth Element. Um, Austin Powers, a movie that I'm not totally in love with. I don't think it's aged really well. Uh, I loved it back then, um, I'm not, but uh, it was hugely successful. Uh, Con Air and Face Off. Nicolas Cage had two big movies of the year, two of his better movies in 1997 uh, before he went totally insane. Uh, <laughs> Men in Black, Will Smith's movie, uh, came out that year, as well as Jackie Brown, and then one that you had mentioned, Jeff, Waiting for Guffman. These are all, I think, some of the best movies of 1997 love them all but boogie nights i think i would put at the top of that list yeah i feel like watching it again yeah it's a fine film yep good stuff that's so that's my number three real quickly uh boogie nights one of the f- only laser discs i ever bought because oh, yeah. lasers were very expensive yeah and i wish i had saved it because um there's a uh, big chunk of a documentary about john holmes on there called exhausted and uh which is fascinating to see all the um parallels between the Dirk Diggler character sure. and John Holmes. Yeah. And apparently they couldn't get the rights for f- any future DVD or Blu-ray releases. So the laser is the only that place feature on it. Right. Uh, oh, so interesting. Yeah. Hmm. But that laser disc is out of print and, and out I of my house. Mark Wahlberg's best role. Hands down. Hands down. Yeah. I think it's everybody's best role. Outside of Philip Seymour Hoffman, I would agree. Yeah. I, I said that to be dramatic. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sure there's a couple in there. I would, I would disagree yeah, with yeah. But, Lester yeah. bangs. Anyways, there you go. Oh, boy. Jeff's favorite song. Heather Graham's best role, probably. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, she had two big ones. This and then the next year. <laughs> she <laughs> she t- never mind. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, well done. I'll leave it at that. Anyways, what do you have, Anthony? Yeah. Number two. There's two other Heather Graham movies that I'm okay with. Another Wisconsin Connection, right? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I'm going with num- uh, One Hit Wonders for number two. So there's quite a few here. I'm gonna have to have to pull some of these up. So you got Marcy's Playground, Sex and Candy, Chumbawamba, Tub Thumping, which you're hearing, Aqua's Barbie Girl. Uh, I would say Hanson. Uh, can you name another Hanson song that isn't a Christmas song? I, w- I will. I could, but I'm not gonna. Oh yeah. No, you don't. You don't get it. All right. <laughs> uh, Return of the Mac, Mark Morrison, The Freshman, The uh, Verve Pipe. Uh, you also have. Is it The Verve who did Bittersweet Symphony? Yeah. And then lost all their money because they were sued by Rolling Stones. Jesus. Um, they made no money off of that song. Their that's only song. Yeah. Is that the uh, song about the old people that commit suicide? Not quite. <laughs> that is Fastball the Way <laughs> for the third week in a row. <laughs> that will be on the 1998 episode. I or 99. Promise. I promise you. I will get it in there. But uh, no, we're not talking about that one. But these are the one-hit wonders of 1997. You guys have a particular favorite? 
Out of that list? Well, there's, I mean, there's kind of some stinkers in there, but yeah, of that list, what would you go with? Uh, they're all so bad. Uh, you don't like Bittersweet Symphony? Sure, I'll take it. I think yeah, the freshman. I think the freshman is. We were only freshmen. I think that's a. I think right? that's a good song. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah one yeah. that's on your list there is one headlight. Oh, that's a, see, that's a good one. I'm, yeah, I'm actually going. might be getting to that one in my number one. Oh, I'm a sorry. Little, well, no, it's okay. That's all right. That one. Sorry. That's all right. No, sorry. it's okay. It's a, let's edit this. It's in a. <laughs> you won't. You won't see it coming. All right. Or maybe you will. Maybe you will. So there you go. The, the one hit wonders is my number two for 1997. There's plenty of them. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Not a great year for albums. No, like. <laughs> a great year for a lot of things. Come on, yet you, you know, time out of mind. One album of the year at the Grammys. All right. And B I Dylan like was it. Dylan was playing a little song from that album, and then some dude came up with Soy Bomb soy written bomb. on his, oh, on his chest. Who was right. it again? Who was it? It was some dude. You want you want this, you want his name? I could pull it up. No, no, Just it's okay. Dude. I'll figure it out. I'm good. <laughs> Nobody, somebody you know personally? Yeah, I know a lot of soy bombs. Trail Duick. <laughs> You're close on the pronunciation. Thank you. On either name? Uh, mm -hmm. The first one you got. My number two on my list. Shout out to T Bird. Jim. My number two on my list. Uh, I just like to figure out what he's playing. Mm -hmm. um, there's this thing called the Academy Awards. Yes. You heard, heard of of, you heard of them? Heard of them. Who's yeah. that? And uh, every year it, uh, they pick a bunch of movies and they're called the nominees. And then they pick one and it's the winner. Yep. Yep. Checks and out. a lot of <laughs> a lot of years I have. Uh, uh, middling to a uh, little respect for some of the films that they pick but this year now these would have been films that would have been that would have won or not won in 98 to be technical about it but I'm calling this category films eventually nominated for best picture I think it's a darn fine list here in 97 these are the films that came out in 97 that would be nominated in 98 some of which we've already discussed full Monty I mean that's that's fine that's my least favorite of the five I think Goodwill Hunting. Nobody's mentioned Goodwill Hunting on this episode. That's crazy. It's a darn fine film. I mean, at the end of the movie, when we uh, and I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this for anybody, when Ben Affleck goes to pick up Matt Damon and he finds out that he's you know, gone. Up, girl. Yeah, I mean that's that's a tearjerker moment. What, what, what are you doing with your ear yeah, there? He's doing earmuffs. He doesn't. He doesn't want to know the end. Oh, the spoiler. Okay. Yeah, it's and been it's, a while. It's probably. Maybe Robin Williams' is best... Uh, won him an Oscar. It Lover? did win him an Oscar. I, mean, I also like World According to Garp, which is going way back. And I also like Moscow on the Hudson. But he's very good in uh, Goodwill Hunting. How do you like them apples? Ellie Confidential, with Jameson mentioned, that's a darn fine film that uh, for some reason I feel like is uh, overlooked now. Maybe it's because maybe it's the Kevin Spacey connection. I think even before that, that that movie is kind of glossed over in a lot film. of ways. It's yeah. not a sexy film. Uh, Kim Basinger. I think it is a she very won good Academy movie. Award for that as well. Yeah, best actress. That was the whole was the other fella, Guy campaign. Guy that was Pierce, the whole Russell Crowe. Guy yeah. Pierce was pretty good. Yeah, directed by Curtis Hansen. Right. Uh, as good as it gets, I, uh, I we, nobody mentioned that. That's uh, uh, well, got some Nicholson great performances. Hel well, Helen Hunt won Best Actress, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she did. Look it up. Basinger won Supporting Actress. Yeah. 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 Greg Kinnear did not win. <laughs> what a robbery! Uh, you make me want to be a better man. I mean, you know, Thank that's you. and then Titanic, which we've already discussed, which again doesn't deserve all the accolades, but it's a it's a fine. Way to spend four and a half hours. One of the last times I can remember, though, the Academy gave the movie that made the most money all the awards. They're like, oh, you get it all. You're amazing. And there's been a pushback from that recently now. Right. Since then, really, where it's almost a detriment to be the huge blockbuster that makes a billion dollars. The Academy's like, you're a little too successful, a little too popular for us. We like to go more artsy. Is Lord of the Rings the exception to that? Or yeah, but that was almost a money? Lifetime Achievement Award for them okay. because they gave it to Return of the King, which... You know, I think it was very much a lifetime achievement award. Like okay. you've done so well. How do you feel about that? I think it's. Be I think. I'm um, okay with it. All right. Well, uh, wasn't that just the next year that uh, Shakespeare in Love beat out Saving Private Ryan? That was the 1999 Academy Awards. Yeah. That made me angry. Yeah. 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 Um, I think that was the pushback from. And whatever happened to this idea of the Academy Awards giving out a film for most popular movie? That's or, been nixed now. Yeah, but not happening. Why not? Because it's dumb. Well, it is dumb, but you got Deadpool two to get an Academy Award. It's Nobody fun. wants that. It's that was... fun. no, we're just handing out participation awards. Why don't we do Best Kiss? Okay, let's do it. Let's at do the, the, at the Oscars. Music awards. Why not video video music awards? <laughs> Yikes! All right. But of those five films, 
Yes. I think Goodwill Hunting is my favorite. Well, or, or LF uh, Confidential. No, that's Sorry. That's tough. Okay. Um, my number two is kind of touching a little bit off of what Anthony was talking about. My number two is, for my money, I think that 1997 is the epicenter of the worst of pop culture of the 90s. If you look at 1997, everything that is hokey and cheesy and terrible about the 90s can be found <laughs> in 1997. So my number two is the worst of 90s pop culture. Wow. Television. Teletubbies started in 1997. Allie McBeal, which I truly thought was horrific as a television show. I thought it was just popcorn schmaltz. I <laughs> love that show. Um, <laughs> it, all it was was like, ooh, look how short their skirts are. Look how skinny Calista Flockhart is. <laughs> and they all shared a bathroom. That, yeah, was, that, that was, was fun. That was just so hokey. Musically, you mentioned some of these. The ones I wrote down, though, that for me are just the worst. Uh, Hanson with Mbop, Aqua with Barbie Girl, Chumba Wumba with Tub Thumping. Awful. This is the worst of pop culture music. Movies, Batman and Robin. Beautician and the Beast, starring Fran Drescher, was a movie. Joe Pesci went from being in Casino to making Gone Fishing and Eight Heads in a Duffel Bag. Um, you had Speed 2 Cruise Control where you take a very successful movie and take a dump on the deck of it. Um, you also have, in just in toys and pop culture, Beanie Babies became a thing, as well as Tamagotchis. You have idiots trying to feed a fake animal to keep it alive. My mom had a Tamagotchi, and I was embarrassed by it because she was her life revolved around this stupid fake animal. It was embarrassing. I think the absolute worst of 90s pop culture resides in 1997. That's awesome. Oh, it <laughs> almost awesome. makes me angry. It's just so that abhorrent. Yes. There you go. That's my number two. All things that Jeff loved. Hmm. Right? How many Tamagotchis did you have dangling off your I really your had phone? a hard time um, paring down my list for this year. So yeah. I disagree with you that 97 was full of crap. I thought 97 no, had. I didn't say 97 was full of crap. I said the crap from the 90s resides in 97 more than any other year. That this is the epicenter of crap. Well, you're taking you're taking a uh, uh, part of your list that could have gone to something that you liked, and you're why would I? Why does it have to be something I like? It doesn't have to be. This is all about things that are big in '97. These things yeah, were just... massive in '97, and they were all hot garbage. How big? How big was Barbie Girl? Barbie Girl was huge. Absolutely. I don't remember, I don't remember that song. Oh my, at all. Gosh. my gosh! Massive yeah, everywhere. Absolutely everywhere. 100%. All the time. Z104. Yes. Once every half hour. Absolutely. So that's my number two. There you go. Whew, thanks, guys. Good stuff. Does that feel good to get uh, get that, get rid of that? I hate all those things. Oh goodness. Number one. You guys excited for this? With a bullet. Gosh. We've come such a long way. We've come so far, guys. So many red vines have been eaten. You only went to number seven in the U.S. Only. It's pretty good. It was. It wasn't exactly wannabe. <laughs> That's the most iconic pop song of all judges, time, you told us. So Jeff judges every song. Yeah. Well, it's no wannabe. It was no Mbop. Uh, I do love Mbop nope. and Ellie McBeal. But, yeah, you're right on with most of that. All right. What do you have for us at number one? I've been searching my soul. He's like the old man in the corner now. He's just, <laughs> yeah. We, why do we turn his mic on? <laughs> okay. For number one on my list, I have the MTV Video Music Awards from 1997. This is, as I said, this is. I probably got cable the week or two before this, oh, and wow. all, everything was like on TV was like, watch this, watch this, and I was, uh, I was all in on watching the MTV Music Video Awards, hosted by Chris Rock at Radio City Music Hall. You had pre-show performances by the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones and the Foo Fighters. Uh, it was Pat Smear who played a little bit with Nirvana, retired from the Foo Fighters, or retired at that show. He would eventually come back, and he's been with Foo Fighters like the last. I don't know, eight to ten years or something like yeah. that. Uh, really good performance of "Mo Money, Mo Problems" by Puff Daddy. One, one of my favorite songs of his, or I'm or with you know Notorious B.I.G. Uh, then, at the end of that performance, they did "I'll Be Missing You," Faith Evans, Sting came out to do to do the song with them. Um, uh, I'll be missing you. Also, won best R&B video. You had Prodigy doing "Breathe" live. You had the you had uh, "Say You'll Be There" done by the Spice Girls instead of "Wanna Be" because once again, looking at the camera, "Say You'll Be There" is a better song it than is. "Wanna Be." It True just statement. is. Uh, Beck did "New Pollution." That was a lot of fun. He won a bunch of awards that night. Wallflowers. We talked about one-hit wonders. The Wallflowers did one headlight 
with Bruce Springsteen, mm -hmm. some of the cool mashups. Uh, Jamiroquai won Best Video for Virtual Insanity, which I don't, I don't know if anyone would disagree with that. I think this song has a, a very good video, not one of my favorite Marilyn Manson songs. But this is kind of when the world really got introduced to Marilyn Manson. You'd heard about this crazy, gothic, satanic son of a gun. That's scary. And he was absolutely frightening as he uh, you know, came out and did the fascist leader thing at the podium and the the banners and had the marching band come out before him and and talked about if uh if you want to go to heaven to be with a bunch of a-holes and people were just absolutely frightened as he broke into beautiful people and the the, the costume that he had on later a year later he would do the kind of glam rock total opposite of this but this is the first time people were like you actually got to see who this marilyn manson person was and i was in fourth grade and i was frightened and scared, but I loved it. And I, he came to be one of my favorites of all time. They think and, he's a righteous uh, dude. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I absolutely loved this. This uh, The MTV Music Video Awards, you also had Fiona Apple with a with a really weird acceptance speech mm -hmm. about how everything is fake. Yeah. Um, uh, but the Marilyn Manson stuff to me was the biggest part. I almost had him as alone for 1997 on my list. But I just couldn't find a way to, to make it happen. I'm including it here. Nice. Uh, there you go. The MTV Music Video Awards. Yes. I loved, I thought this was so cool as a kid. I love it. Yes. All right. And Jeff has Marilyn Manson as well. <laughs> Keep it cued. <laughs> so you got cable TV in 97? I believe so. So weren't you watching like Skinamax or something like anything like that? Scramble porn instead of, instead of uh, no. the VMAs? You got to do that at Grandma's house. Yeah. There's a theory behind uh, the uh, one headlight with uh, Springsteen that I don't really buy into. But, you know, at that time, he had just released Ghost of Tom Joad, which was kind of a, you know, which was very much a folky album. Okay. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the theory is that we found his rock voice again when he played with the Wallflower oh, Flowers. It's a great performance. It was. I enjoyed very, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. <sighs> Um, let's do our number. Wait, was that your number one? Yeah, this is number one. Oh, so it's my number one. Yeah. My number one is something that you guys have already discussed. It is the premiere of South Park on Comedy Central. I have this vague recollection, and I might have dreamt this, but I feel like I went to see Jon Stewart in concert somewhere, and, um, it was the first, and he, as intermission or as a warm up, he showed, uh, The Spirit of Christmas, which is the original, uh, South Park, um, short. Uh, along with maybe Frog Baseball, which was the original Beavis mm. and Butthead. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you guys have already covered South Park. I think it's the closest in spirit to uh, to Monty Python. You guys know I'm a big Monty oh, Python wow. fan, so you've got the uh, you know the cutout animation, just like Terry Gilliam's cutout cutout animation on, on Python. I think there's a lot of the same tone and uh, subversiveness that is in Python uh, carries forward to South Park. I think South Park has done a great job in lampooning and satirizing current events and is not afraid to take on some of the big topics of the day. It seems like they can turn things around very, very quickly, which I'm impressed by. I think the writing is very sharp. I agree with you that it's underrated as far as the intelligence of the scripts. Um, you know, Mr. Hanky the Christmas Poo and uh, Cartman's mom is a dirty slut and uh, <laughs> just all the characters are so great and... Um, I don't know. It just never gets uh, never gets old, and so uh, South Park is my number one. Nice. That's unexpected. I didn't think you'd have that number one. I like that. There you go. Very good. I also have NWA as of number course. one. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, my number one is uh, 1997 was the year that Ben and Matt broke out. Uh, Chasing Amy came out in April of 1997. It was Ben Affleck's big breakout role. It showed that he had some diversity to him. He had a little something. He wasn't just a background character. It was his starring vehicle. Uh, for my money, it's Kevin Smith's most complete film. It's my favorite Kevin Smith film, easily. Um, wow. I think it's his best written film, best shot film. It has the most heart to it, most real characters. Um, and it showcased his range. Matt Damon had a bit role in that movie. I forgot about that. Yep. But uh, And then... Uh, in November, uh, Matt Damon got his first big starring role in The Rainmaker, um, a movie directed by Francis Ford Coppola based on a John Grisham novel. It was a huge moment for him. In fact, when, I mean, this is a taboo name to talk about now, but when he was trying to get, he and Ben were trying to get uh, uh, Goodwill Hunting made, he told Harvey Weinstein, I just got cast in The Rainmaker. And he said, holy crap, those John Grisham movies always make $100 million. 
Let's make your movie happen. That's what got Goodwill Hunting made was wow. him getting cast in mm. The Rainmaker. And then in December, Goodwill Hunting comes out. Ben and Matt win best original screenplay for their writing on this movie. Robert Williams wins best supporting actor. It's nominated for best picture. It's made for $10 million. They haul in $225 million at the box office. It is like the biggest Cinderella story of two guys. And suddenly... How do you like them apples? Overnight, these two are the Wonder Kid superstars. They are no longer these unknown guys who were, you know, characters in in school ties. Suddenly, they're Ben and Matt, and they can do whatever they want in Hollywood, and they have ever since. Um, the next year, Matt Damon is suddenly... He's Private Ryan. He's the titular Private Ryan, as he was the titular Will Hunting. Um, but, you know, opposite opposite Tom Hanks. Ben Affleck is in the best picture, uh, uh, the Shakespeare Shakespeare in Love. Yeah, And sure. he's also in Armageddon in the next year. So things really start to happen for these guys. But uh, in, in one year, they went from who are they to we have to have them. And I think Goodwill Hunting, I know I said Boogie Nights is my favorite movie. I think Goodwill Hunting might be my favorite movie that year. I just rewatched it again last week. It's so good. It's a good film. This was so well written. This was a great year to rewatch some stuff. Like, I love Cole Hauser awesome. in that movie so much. I love Casey Affleck in the movie. He's he's such a goofball. Um, but yeah, that's 90, 97 made those guys into massive Hollywood superstars. A list guys. I like that a lot. There you go. I've been double teamed by Matt and Ben. Yeah, yeah. It was a good time. Got the old Toronto taint job on. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's rough. Man, you never want that to happen in the back of a Buick. <laughs> All right, so before we move any further, we have to draw a year for next week's program to figure out what we're going to be talking about. Jeff, I want you to reach into this here bucket and pull out a year for us. Uh, is, what? We didn't talk about the TV rating system started in 97. Yeah. The View started in 97. Oh. Uh, Romeo and Michelle. Romeo and Michelle. Sorry. City Guys. Also, uh, Virtual Pets didn't make my list, but I totally the had a game, got you. I, I, the I game's a you. fine I, I film. up its poop. After and everything? Oh, it was awesome. What is wrong with you? Yeah. I had a Gigapet and a Tamagotchi. <laughs> it was awesome. I Unfortunately, I didn't get the Princess Diana Beanie Baby. Spanish Prisoner, that's a good movie. We didn't talk about that. In and Out, starring uh, Kevin Klein and Tom Selleck. Didn't talk about Copland. Copland. That's a good movie. Spice World. Yeah. Interleague right. Baseball started in 1997. What am, oh, hmm. what am I pulling Brewers here? Brewers came to the National League. There you go. Like what am I reaching in here? Doesn't matter. Reach on in here. Pull a pull a number. That's not going to end going. well. Yes. Let's do it. Let's make it happen, buddy. Any year. So next week, uh, Sunday, 8 p.m. Pop Culture Timecast will be coming at you, and we'll be talking about the year that is 2011. 2011. That is what we're talking about. I turned 40 years old that year. My goodness. Woohoo! How exciting. Stay tuned for that. You can find us online on Twitter on, at underscore PCTC. You can also find all of our previous episodes are going up at sunprayemediacenter.com. On Demand Player, you can watch uh, them there. Also, uh, as of Friday, uh, K-Sun has its own Roku channel. So if you have a Roku box, you can nice. uh, search K-Sun and uh, get all of our shows on your Roku. I like it. Take us out, Mr. Danu. All right, folks, that does it. We'll see you next week in 2011. Leaving you now, you're listening to Harvey Danger, Flagpole Sitter, another one of the wonderful number one-hit uh, one wonders. Uh, but before we get out of here, I'm going to give you some Damn It by Blink-182.